Well, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. And um, I'm so happy you showed up today. I'm Monica Wahi, and it gives me great pleasure and joy today to share with you some great R packages that I've run into in my work with my customers for health data analytics. Now, um, thank you so much for showing up. And I apologize in advance. I think I might have tried to cram too much into one lecture. I, I'm not doing any um, software demonstrations or programming demonstrations, but I got code for you. Um, you can download these lectures uh, on the link on the, um, like the, the these lectures. You can download these slides and get the links in the slides and get the code in the slides. But also, um, as you can see in today's lecture on the left side of the slide, First, the first half of my presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the R packages I use when I do factor analysis. Now, I'm aware I got a lot of SAS users here, and what's wrong with SAS for factor analysis? Nothing. In fact, SAS is much easier, probably, to use for factor analysis. But if you want to use R, I show you what I do when I use R. And then the second part of this, I'm going to show you some R visualization packages, which are not... GGplot2, they use GGplot2, but they're sort of special ones that I don't see people using a lot. And what I'm kind of famous for is I'll explain the use case. And, you know, it's always cool. Like most of the time you're making like bar charts and time series plots, you know, because you have, you're trying to do something or it's a QQ plot or whatever. But once in a while you, you've got this special visualization need and just matching the need up with the use case need with the weird or unique plot, that is half the battle, right? So that's what I like to do on my blog posts is just make it really clear, like, what are the ca cases in which you would use this plot? Now, before I go on, um, next week, I'm holding my online workshop, Application Basics, Working with R. It's a free workshop and it's online. So please, if you want to go sign up now, um, it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of next week from 2 p.m. to, or I'm sorry, from 12 p.m. Eastern time. I'm sorry if you're not in Eastern time, you'll have to translate this into your time zone. But 12 p.m. Eastern time, to block, I'll have you block off your calendar for three hours. It depends on how many people show up. Because it is a workshop, uh, what would happen is I'm going to lecture. It's based on an online course I made, which you'll get free access to. This is a real deal. You can um, and you can sign up in a in the link on um on the event on this LinkedIn event that you obviously signed up for, or you wouldn't be here, right? Um, but please sign up if you want to come. If you have time to come, because what we'll do is I'll teach you about applications. I'll teach you about how how to like sort of the big picture of like making application pipelines and what the way i'm going to teach it this time is we're going to concentrate on r i'm uh, like when you do your breakout and your uh, uh group assignments we're going to be thinking of ways of getting r into our application pipeline which um actually is <laughs> it's so natural for me i remember back like <laughs> like 20 years ago, I hate to say, to say that, but it was still S plus then or whatever. I got, I got kind of mad because I was trying to make a forest plot. And I remember I was, I ended up turning to R and that it just never stopped after that. So I just want to emphasize um, this workshop is free and it's next week and it's online. So please register. If you want to go, please. Yes. Sign up um for the, uh, workshop and I'll send you the materials to get started. All right, enough of that commercial and on to the program. So first we're going to talk about factor analysis. Now, um, you want to download these slides if you want to link to all these um, these packages, but, um, oh, and also the abstract from the paper published. Um, here is what I'm going to, I'm going to talk about when an actual use case I had when I was doing factor analysis and I was doing it in R. No, but before we go too far, I just want to remind everybody what factor analysis is. So sometimes um, 
so this is the case I had, and there's other cases where you use factor analysis, but the case I had is I had a customer who was making a psychometric instrument. Okay. So one of those instruments that if you fill it out, it, you end up with subscales and there's scores on the subscales and it means something. So you might be familiar with that from management. Like if you're in management courses, they'll make you fill out something and then they'll say, like, um, like, especially I was talking about the Myers-Briggs with one of my customers, you know, are you an E or an I, you know, you get a score, right? Well, if, if you ever take one of those things, this is the back engineering. This is how those things got there. That's how the E and I thing got there. That's how all those subskills got there is what happened was people started out by, with just a whole bunch of statements, like, you have to agree. Imagine a Likert scale of like one to five and five is strongly agree and then somewhat agree all the way down to strongly disagree. And statements are like, I'm the kind of person who likes to show up early to class. OK, so is that five, four, three, one. I'm the kind of person who puts off doing my homework to the last minute. OK, so I'm, I'm kind of joking. Because I, don't, I don't know where I'm going with this, but imagine you're making a psychometric instrument about how students behave or something. You might have those kinds of um, statements. Right. So let's carry this analysis a little bit. Let's say I am making a psychometric instrument to figure out what kind of student you are. I might pick sort of three pre-specified domains. Like I might say, OK, how good are you at homework? How good are you at in class, you know, because homework and in class is different. And then maybe how good are you uh, like one on one, like when we're together? I don't know. I'm making stuff up. So if you're making a psychometric instrument and you do what I just did, you select three domains. I just chose three. Uh, a good friend of mine told me, he's like, Monica, first time around, put 10 on each domain. I'm like, 10? then you can't pick that many domains. So let's say we got 30. We got uh, 30 statements, 10 on each domain. So I got 10 hope work statements and 10 go in class statements. You see where I'm going with this. And I give it to a bunch of students. Okay, now I've got this data. And I've got the question is, are my three factors going to come out? Is homework going to hang together? Is the in class going to hang together? Which is what factor analysis is and what I'm talking about happens to be confirmatory factor analysis because we had pre-specified domains earlier in my career one day I just grabbed a bunch of statements from a quality of life uh, a bigger quality of life uh, instrument and I threw them at some medical students but I didn't have any pre-specified domains I kind of didn't know what I was doing and that's how I met the person who taught me this and they're like well you know how many pre-specified domains, so we're doing EFA, <laughs> exploratory factor analysis. And so I was like, all right, let's see what happens. And we did. We 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 got some domains out of it. But in any case, if you're in SAS and you've got my customer's data, what it looks like is a bunch of columns that say one through five on them, right? And I know what the columns mean. We have documentation. But our question is, are the homework ones or whatever, all the same ones falling out on the same factors? So it's just a bunch of like internal correlations. I'm bad at math, but that's the best you can, I could say. And if you if you got SAS and you put it in proc factor, you know, SAS is it's like a like a full service restaurant. They come and they give you all the information you'd ever need, all these plots. And you can sit and go, oh, do I like my factors or don't I? But in R, you've got to sort of tell it exactly what you want. So I'm going to just now I, in the future, if you hang out with me and connect with me on LinkedIn or whatever, um, stick around because I'll probably turn what I'm going to show you eventually into a blog post and give you some data and stuff to download but for now i just have it in this um in this slide presentation okay so here it is so what's the first thing that happens when i've got my customer's data and she's got three domains um and they're a bunch of likert scales well one of the domains was ident it was like identity something 
and ident if you can look at the slide we had one two three four five we had five items on the ident so here's what i did is i this is just a a, a vector of the names of the variables and i just put it in a a, a vector named ident bars these are just the names well, why I did that is there's a tricky trick you can do in R where, see, up here, the the um, data set I read in is, I call it analytic. That's the name of it. Well, see down here where I go analytic in these brackets and I put ident vars. If you just list the variables you want to keep from there, it'll just keep those. So what I did was I just listed the variables, the names of the variables I wanted to keep and I kept it in ident bars. And down here, I just made ident. And why am I doing that? Well, first, I'm going to want to do a Kronbach alpha. So what's a Kronbach alpha? It's a correlation test. Now, I, feel, I always feel bad because I'm so bad at this. It's a correlation test that looks at how intercorrelated all the answers are to those items. So I have to pick out the items and say, okay, give me the Kronbach alpha. And the rule is if the Kronbach alpha is less than 0.7, they're not very intercorrelated. And that's uh, an issue. That means you don't have a subscale, you know, game over. Go back to the drawing board. So that was the first thing for my customers. You'll see there's three domains on there. There's Ident, TC, and BI, and I really don't remember what they mean. Actually, <laughs> this was like years ago. Um, and so first I was going to try and figure out the Kronbach alpha for each of them. And you'll see here that I'm doing that with the ident. So I picked out from analytic the ident vars, and I'm using the library psych. Now, I just want to step back and say the library psych has a lot of good stuff in it. I, more uh, like throughout my life, I bump into it kind of often. This is one of those times I like, I think it's got some plots in it. It's, it's a really good um, package. Okay. So now I'm running, see this code alpha. I'm running alpha on ident and ident is just a data frame with the ident vars in it. Okay. Let's, I'll bet you're dying to see the alpha. I was dying to see the alpha. Ta -da, here's the alpha. So this is from the console here. Point seven. Remember, I said it'd be, you know, I'd throw it away if it wasn't good enough. Well, here's the alpha. So we did that to each of them. Now, I've got some bad news for you. Alpha is a little bit like loosey goosey. Like you have to have a pretty bad subscale before alpha like doesn't like you. So, um, so I would, but this was a kind of high alpha, you know, and point seven is kind of loosey goosey. I don't know. It's industry standard. Okay. Moving next on, the other thing we wanted to see was when we did the factor analysis, we hoped that all the ident variables all were in a correlated with each other and not correlated with the TC variables, which would be intercorrelated with each other, which are not correlated with the BI variables. Like that's what we really hoped to confirm in our confirmatory factor analysis. It doesn't always come out the way you think it will, but that's what we're going to try to do. So what you'll see here is I, these are the names of all the items, right? These are the ident items, the TC items. There's like four of them, the BI items. Okay. And so I put those into this one big, um, these are just, this is just a vector of names. So remember that tricky trick I said that you can do, <laughs> SAS is so jealous about this, you know, can you imagine like data B set A and then you'd have to list the variables you want to keep or I don't know. Yeah, keep equals. Remember all those? Well, here I just made this vector of all the variables names I want to keep. And I put these brackets and then analytic is in here. And then I created, I know this is kind of an ugly name, factor underscore P underscore DF. DF stands for data frame. This is just to remind me it's data frame. Guess who comes next? Psych, right? Psych. I love psych. That's it's such a good package. Okay. So now we're this is our data frame that has all of our Likert scale variables from all of our um our different uh uh domains. Three domains that we planned, pre-planned. So this is confirmatory, right? So I'm gonna run principle on it on this data frame from the psych command from the site uh, uh, package. Now, 
I'm doing in this code N factors three. I'm forcing it into three factors because I thought we had three factors. But I'm going to tell you the truth is when I, I, I do a lot with this customer and she does a lot with um, psychometric, um, built, making psychometric measurements. And I usually try three, four, and five factors. And I see which fits the best because we're trying to make an instrument. We're trying to make a measurement. We're not trying to just like game it. You know, we're trying to really do a good job. And then this rotate equals Varimax. I, you know, sometimes the reviewers don't like that I'm doing that. They say uh, you should only do that when you're doing exploratory, like if you didn't plan these three. But the problem is we do a bad job. Me and this customer are terrible. I, I We do, just do a terrible job. I mean, she's brilliant and I'm smart, but we just do a really bad job of planning these factors. We We, we make domains. We put items on the domain. Then we do this and we get totally different domains. You'll see what happens here. So we run the principal command on this. We I force it into three factors, but remember in real life, I'd look at all three, four, and five. I throw in the Verimax and I create this object fit three and then we'll look at fit three next. So as you can see, this is the output. RC1, RC3, and RC2 are the three factor loadings I force it into. And you can easily see what I want to load together. Like I want all these. I want that like this says 80. I wish all of them said 80, but this one says 0.24. Okay. So this one obviously and maybe this one was whatever I thought ident was, but then what's going on down here? So see these are all high and I thought these would be high and it would be low here. And then where it says TC, I thought these would be high. Like TC is nothing. Like TC is actually over here. It's just a, <laughs> it's a mess. All right. But, but that's why you do research, right? So we had to pick through this and sort of figure out, well, what, what do we have? And do we only have three? Do we have four? You know, what do we have? So I don't know. We just had to um, do something about it. Now, another thing you can do when you're trying to do what we're doing is make a scree plot. Now, I'm going to just admit to you, I don't understand all this code. I went and stole it from the internet, right? Got to love the internet. Got to love open source R. So the library, the um, package I'm using is N factors. And remember this uh, data frame from a minute ago? Well, I'm using that same data frame and we're getting eigenvalues, okay? And the first step is to put in this object called EV and then run this super complicated thing I totally don't understand. And then you just just follow this code. Just do what they say. Why? You get this. Isn't this gorgeous? This is one of the most gorgeous things I've ever seen. I love it. I don't even want to touch it. I don't even know how it got there. But what you care about is this line, okay? So my customer and I, we thought we had three domains. And so if this would have looked the way we thought, it would be like, one, two, three, and then there would be an inflection, right? But here, I don't know. It looks like either there's a big inflection here. Remember, one and two were kind of together. Or maybe you could argue the inflection is here. But it, it, this just didn't come out as cleanly as we wanted to. Um. All right. So does anybody have any questions about that? Because that was just my demonstration of how to do um the factor analysis portion of this. The next is I'm going to go on to doing the ggplot2 visualization. This is kind of a grab bag today. Okay, so you'll see on the slides, um, I, and I've i got three plots for you. And they're special because they're not ggplot2 plots per se. I mean, they probably use ggplot2. But they're not ggplot2 plot the, the same ones we always make, which are time series and... Um, and like, you know, bar charts and you, know, you always have to make a histogram. I'm just going to go over three and um, the links to these uh, uh, blog posts are on, in the slides. And also um, we have uh, the code here. I'll, I'll show you how to make these. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the upset plot. And I, I first, let me just go down here and explain what it is. Like I hadn't even really heard of it here. Let me just kind of. So the upset plot is really good and you don't have to publish it all the time, but it's really good when you're wondering how things are grouping together, okay? So in this case, 
what the problem was is we had all these um we had this data set of people who had multiple chronic diseases one or more chronic diseases and i was trying to figure out do they all have one chronic disease or do they have patterns of chronic disease and this really answered it because this is how you read this plot is these are the chronic diseases okay so the first one here, arthritis, there's just a dot. That means this represents the group that only has arthritis, okay? And this is total number of people have arthritis here. And this is the total number of people who have this um, combination, which is only one thing. So the in this data set, the top three situations were having just arthritis, having just depression, or having just diabetes. So this answered my question. I'm like, are all these people like having multiple things or do they have just one thing? But as you would guess, since depression and arthritis are really popular in this data set, the next, the fourth most common pattern was depression and arthritis together here. And so you can see here under here, this is the raw depression count and the raw arthritis count. And here is the count of the pattern. Okay, and I'm just going to tell you, this has changed my life, this upset path. I'll, t I'll tell you where it changed my life. It changed my life when I was trying to visual visualize microbiome data, like data from like where you can have multiple uh, bacteria or multiple pathogens. Like one experimental unit can have like just one pathogen or just another pathogen or both of them or or organisms you know those those kind of situations um let me see another one is when people are taking drugs like taking just lipid lowering drugs or just hypertension drugs whatever this is so useful for that and so this is um i'm using the uh package upset r which is easy to use it's just that you got to put on your thinking cap because you've got to format your data in such a way to make it easy. Actually, if you just go to my blog post and follow what it says, uh, it's, it's good. Like you can specify all these colors and stuff, but don't bend your brain. Like I did. As soon as I figured this out, I just made this blog post so you can follow it and then, you know, you know what to do. All right. So that was the first one. That's the upset plot. So don't be upset. Like the upset plot. All right, here's the second thing. Now, you're probably like, okay, Monica obviously does a lot with Likert scale stuff, and I certainly do. And so here's the problem is, like, remember the customer I was just talking about with this factor analysis? Okay, well, let's say we want to look at the actual raw answers that they gave. You know, like I was giving the homework exam. You know, I'm the kind of person who shows up early for class or whatever. You know, how many how many strongly agrees are there? How many strongly disagrees? Well, this visualization is so awesome. And I didn't invent it. It's the Likert, it's the Likert package. Okay, so let me just go through how you interpret this visualization. Um so in my data, I often enc I encourage my customers to use five levels in their Likert scales. Once in a while, I might bend that, but most of the time, people just think that way. So I and I encourage them in whatever language they're using to have the top one be five and be strongly agree. The next one be somewhat agree then neither agree nor disagree that's just really clear then it's clear than neutral then somewhat disagree and strongly disagree and if you format your data that way then this package works really well because he here are just five items right now these items w could have been in any order in the native data set what the likert package does is it orders them on the plot with the most agree so it it adds up strongly agree and somewhat agree. And actually, I don't know, you probably can't see the um, numbers here. They're a little, maybe I can screw this up here. Okay, so down here on the um, on the x-axis, you'll see this says zero here in the middle. This is the three. And then the percentage out here is the percentage of people who are saying, 
on the agree side and the percentage of people on the disagree side. And I just made this data up. But whatever this is, you can see that there's a large percentage of people that are strongly disagreeing here. And also this middle part here, and you can see there's numbers for the middle part. This is how many people are in the middle, you know, just said the middle one. You see these numbers over here. This is the strongly and somewhat together, those numbers. And this is the disagree and somewhat um, together numbers. So it gives you like this really easy, you can just sit and stare at this. And if you're like, well, you know, you know, like the example I was just giving you about the factor analysis, we had a whole bunch of items in there. I could just break them apart into smaller data sets of just the domains I was looking at or just whatever and make these this chart. The problem with making this chart is oftentimes you'll do a survey and nobody will say one, like strongly disagree for something. And if that happens, it breaks this Likert thing. So I've got this hack on here and it, it is a hack. It's really ugly. In fact, if you go to the um, YouTube um, of associated video, you'll see somebody made a comment with some code in it, which is like the elegant way of doing it. You know, mine is the, I, I don't know how to code way of doing it. So my way works, right? But it's not elegant. Um, and so, but in any case, it gets around the fact that so, like maybe there might've been um, a missing value. Like nobody said four for one of them or nobody said three for one of them. And this fixes it. Uh, it, it doesn't put any fake data or impute any data. It just tricks R into not freaking out and just making your plot. To to be more specific, this plot relies on factor levels for uh, ordinal variables, which is a R thing and not a SAS thing. And it, it's not if it can't get those factors levels right, it doesn't make the plot right. So. So I encourage you to go to that one. If you got Likert um, data, try that one out. And then finally, I have the last one I've got for you is um, this is a dumbbell plot. And this is where I've seen it is when you have an opinion and you have like two political parties, right? So let's say that this was like the blue was Democrats and the red was Republicans, right? You might see something like here is what percentage of people think you should have universal health care. And this might be something like 80% and this be something like 50% or something like that. And so this just shows, and then see, this one is flipped around. And what I did is I just looked up some ratings online between the, uh, on some different um, axes about two different um, colleges just to show you how you can use it for ratings, comparing ratings. Because actually what was happening to me in real life, this is what was happening is I was looking for a hotel. I don't even remember no, why. Oh, I, I think I was going to a wedding. I was going to a wedding in Cleveland. And there was like one of those areas near the wedding that was like where a whole bunch of hotels are in the same area. And so I was like trying to get the best value hotel. So I was on like Travelocity or something. And they'd say like overall, they were all like 4.5 or whatever. But when I went to look at them, each, each they had, um, it's not Travelocity. What is it? Um, I'm forgetting. But they had like multiple ratings, like, like convenience and value. And I wanted to compare the individual ratings, like those individual ratings. And so that's where I sort of came up with this. And so um, that's one more. And this is using, I forgot, it's it's some library here. Uh, yeah, it, it's using ggplot, but this ggalt. I really like this ggalt. I, I think I've done something else with it before. You get to know these things and then see there's you get this dumbbell. So it's basically, oh, and I even made my own legend on here. Sometimes I do that. You know, R is so flexible. You can just do anything you want with it. That's what I love about it.
so if you want to do any of those plots, just get the slides here and go to those web um or those blog posts because I've got actually code there so you can um, try it yourself. All right, so that's what I had to present for you today. I had the whole factor analysis packages and I had these um, plot packages. And again, I want to remind you, I'm Monica Wahi. I hope you're having a good week. And next week, I'm having my um, online workshop. Um, what we're going to be talking about is application basics, which is applications. Like, how do we put applications together? How do we make them work together? And I'm going to have a special focus on R, on how to work R into your application pipelines. So it'll be a real hoot. You'll have fun. And even though we'll be going off of a course, an online course that I have on, that you'll get free access to, um, it's really a workshop. We're going to be doing stuff interactively and um, talking about different application solutions. So you're going to love it. So please make sure to sign up. Um, so thank you very much to everybody who showed up today. I, I hope you um, enjoyed what I uh, was here to tell you. And I hope you try out some of these awesome packages and have an enjoyable week. Thank you for watching this video, which is part of the Public Health to Data Science Rebrand Program. If you are interested in joining the program, please sign up for a 30-minute Zoom interview using the link in the description.